My name is Steve Bardwell, the president of MBCA. This marks the 53rd year of our advocacy for the healthy desert, and we are busier than ever pursuing our mission. At our last in-person meeting, we were honored with the presence of Sean Milanovich from the Native American Land Conservancy, who provided a blessing on our meeting. While we do not have a native representative here today, MBCA, with the guidance from the Conservancy, has crafted the following land acknowledgement that will be placed upon our home uh, webpage. We acknowledge and thank the longest inhabitants of the desert lands for which MBCA advocates. The Kawea, Kemahuevi, Mojave, and Serrano nations who have lands in California and Arizona. Through our mission, we honor and support their long stewardship of these lands. As you've seen on the screen, this meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on our website. At this time, I would like to introduce our board of directors. Directors, if you please unmute yourselves and say hello after introduction. Our vice president, David Fick. Hello, David Fick, Joshua Tree. Our secretary, Lorraine Turk. Lorraine Turk, also Joshua Tree. Hi, everyone. Our new director and treasurer, Kathy Zarikoff. Hi, everybody. Kathy Zarikoff, uh, I'm from Yucca Valley. Our past president, Sarah Kennington. Hello, I'm here in Pipes Canyon. Good morning. Our new director, Stacy Doolittle. Good morning, I'm here in Joshua Tree. Director Pat Flanagan. Good morning, Pat Flanagan here in Desert Heights. Uh, Director Brian Hammer. Uh, good morning all, uh, Brian Hammer um, in Lucerne Valley. Director Janet Johnston. Uh, hi, Janet in Joshua Tree. <laughs> Director Arch McCullough. Hi, I'm Arch. I'm from Morongo Valley. And our new director, uh, Gary Styler. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Gary. I'm in Morongo Valley as well. Welcome. I wish to acknowledge our past directors, uh, Meg Foley and Le Mike Lipsitz, who retired from the board last year, and thank them for the service to our organization. We wish them the very best. I would also like to note the passing of Emeritus Board member, Esther Herbert, who served on the board for many years. We miss her voice. Prior to the pandemic, our annual meeting was an opportunity for members to gather in person to celebrate together and acknowledge our achievements and activities over the past year. Now, during this difficult time, we must rely on, that, on this virtual conference for that connection. The in-person meeting was historically the time to renew your membership in MBCA. With the continued development of our website, we have now revised our protocol for membership renewal to occur at the one-year mark after joining. Following today's meeting, please visit mbconservation.org to join or renew your membership. I encourage you to consider a gift membership to introduce those who share our vision of advocacy for the healthy desert. With any new membership, you will receive a copy of our book, Celebrating the Past and Envisioning the Future, that documents the first 50 years of MBCA's activism and accomplishments. Thanks to Melissa Sobel for her graphic design services in production of the book. Thank you also to director Stacy Doolittle, serving as our social media maven who maintains MBCA's Facebook page that provides links to the many issues we are tracking and documenting. During the consideration of the light trespass ordinance, we received over 4,000 visits to our Facebook page. Amy Buya, who's assisting in producing today's meeting, maintains our Instagram account where we provide links to other like-minded conservation organizations in the desert. During this pandemic, MBCA's Desert Wise Landscape Tour has proceeded apace by creating a virtual publish, 
publication of six high quality videos of desert land landscapes for the 2021 tour. I encourage you to visit our website and experience these examples of desert wise living. The desert wise landscaping tour is funded by generous financial support of our local water agencies, the Bighorn Desert View Water Agency, the High Desert Water District, Joshua Basin Water District, Golden State Water Company, the 29 Palms Water Agency, and the Mojave Water Agency. Barring further restrictions for 2022, we plan to hold a hybrid landscape tour with a mix of videos and in-person sites. As with our previous tours, the landscapes will feature vetted water-wise and energy-wise venues that incorporate native plants and alternative landscape elements appropriate to our desert environment. Our goal is to inform and educate desert residents about living in the desert and the value of our most precious resources. Towards that end, we have created a list of 10 desert wise living tips on our website. Please check out these tips that range from controlling lighting, conserving water, to respecting pioneer and Native American artifacts. Our website now includes a section under MBCA News titled MBCA Takes a Stand, where you can find letters and information describing our position on the myriad issues that affect our desert environment. The effects of the nearly unrestrained growth of short-term rentals in the Morongo Basin are contributing to a severe shortage of housing. Our mission statement advocates for the healthy desert that nurtures our economic well-being, of which safe, affordable housing is the foundation. MBCA has written a comprehensive letter to the state of California outlining, outlining our position on STRs as they relate to the provision of housing in the county of San Bernardino. A copy of this letter is posted at mbconservation.org. Stories abound of families being displaced, employers not able to find workers due to the lack of housing, and sky high prices driven in part by investors converting residences into businesses as short term rentals. Schools are losing students as the teachers and families struggle to find housing. MBCA contends that there are significant inconsistencies between the short term rental ordinance and the housing element of the countywide plan. California state law requires that all elements of the countywide plan be consistent. And we believe this inconsistency is contributory to the housing problem. An annual progress report of available housing is mandated to be submitted to the state and following current reporting requirements, short-term rentals are counted as, get this, vacant housing. We are concerned this incorrect in classification is then affecting federal monies to be allocated towards affordable housing. During the course of analyzing the short-term rental problem, we have become aware of the vast differences in the five supervisorial districts uh, where the fourth district encompasses an area of 3.5 square miles with zero short-term rentals, while our third district covers 1,855 square miles with over 4,000 short-term rentals, a vast difference reflecting the vast size of this largest county in America. NBC is preparing comments for presentation of the County Planning Commission when they consider amendments to the short-term rental ordinance next Thursday, February 3rd. We encourage the attendance at the Planning Commission meeting in Joshua Tree Government Center to express your concerns and offer suggestions. This last year, NBCA directors and as members of the third district dark sky committee were involved in the passage of a new county light trespass ordinance. This ordinance is the culmination of a 12 year plus effort to protect our night sky and was supported by our supervisor Dong Ro and land use services. The ordinance replaces the outdated 2007 glare and outdoor lighting portion of the code 
that was adopted before the development of LED lighting. As of January 6th of this year, all exterior lighting in unincorporated portions of the county must be fully shielded. The ordinance provides for a 24 month window for residential users to comply and 18 months for commercial businesses. We have been assured that county code enforcement will be active in enforcing infractions. No longer will damaging, glare producing and obnoxious lighting be tolerated in the unincorporated portions of the county. MBCA has commented on and tracked many of the utility scale renewable energy developments in the Mojave Desert area. These projects include the Aratina Solar Project in Kern County that will take, as in kill, over 4,000 Joshua trees. The 5,000 acre Oberon Solar Project in Western Nevada, as well as the Solar 66 Project in, in the Daggett area. Most important for our local desert is the Stagecoach Solar Project, west of Highway 247 and north of Lucerne Valley. This 3,000 acre solar farm is planned for land owned by the State Teachers Fund. If approved, Stagecoach would justify the construction of the Calcite Electrical Substation that in turn would facilitate the development of nearly 10,000 acres of utility scale projects, including Ord Mountain, Sienna Solar, and Calcite Solar. MBCA's substantive comments on the draft EIR included a demand for an accounting of the carbon sequestered and the ongoing services the desert provides in capturing carbon. The social justice inequity caused by poor air quality from the project, the effects on wildlife and the damage to the application for scenic highway status for Highway 247. Again, this letter is also found archived at mbconservation.org. MBCA board members have worked with the Homestead Valley communities to advance the application for scenic highway status for Highway 247. A presentation of the Planning Commission was well received and work is now underway to create a corridor protection plan that will ultimately be presented to the Board of Supervisors for their approval. Stagecoach Solar, were it to be constructed, would remove the portion of 247 north of Lucerne Valley for consider consideration as a scenic highway. A segue to our position on utility scale renewable energy projects is the net energy metering decision currently before the California Public Utilities Commission. NEM 3.0 as written would incentivize utility scale solar over rooftop solar. This proposal is supported by California's three investor owned utilities, Southern California Edison, Pacific Gas and Electric and San Diego Gas and Electric. And if passed would effectively destroy the rooftop solar industry in California by drastically cutting the price that utilities pay for excess power generated and by charging customers to install solar on their rooftop. MBCA has submitted comments to the commission in opposition to this proposal. Known as DG, distributed generation of electrical power close to the point of use fosters fosters equity and would be an essential component of a clean, resilient electrical infrastructure desperately needed to address climate change. The long distance, tra distance transmission of power from inappropriately sited utility scale projects conflicts with the imperative to protect habitat and conserve the ecosystem upon which life depends. At the January 27th meeting of the CPUC, they received over 450 oral comments in opposition to NEM 3.0. And a final vote is scheduled for February 10th. Please let your voice be heard and contact the governor and let him know of your opposition to this, uh, to this proposed NEM 3.0. Governor Newsom's executive order N82-20 
calls for conservation of 30% of California land and water by 2030, known as 30 by 30. In this regard, MBCA has been active in demanding that the value of the desert be recognized in this effort. We have joined with other organizations to advocate for the proper accounting of the services provided by the intact desert ecosystem. Referencing studies by university researchers, we argue that the deserts account for fully 10% of carbon captured in the state. There is mycorrhizal life underground in the desert that must be conserved and recognized as an important element in the fight against climate change. MBCA has continued to track and comment upon the disastrous water harvesting proposal by the Cadiz Corporation. We are encouraged that this project for the moment appears to be on hold. However, we are continuing to follow developments as they occur. MBCA awarded the Ruth Dennison Environmental Scholarship to Yucca Valley High School graduate, Kalina Alcandar, Al with the help of a generous expanding our scholarships to local graduating students in 2022. We are also actively working on establishing and supporting a program for middle school students to participate in field trips for outdoor education and experience. We hope to connect local businesses with the local school district to provide opportunities for hiking, climbing and bicycling in our desert. With the pressures of climate change being increasingly apparent, we believe education is the critical component in addressing this existential challenge. MBCA believes that the issue of climate change must be the lens through which so many of the important decisions before us is viewed. Today's speakers are at the forefront of recognizing and acting to address the effects of climate change here in the desert environment. I would now like to introduce our secretary, Lorraine Turk, to say a few words about our long-serving, well-respected, and recently retired board member, Ruth Riemann. Lorraine. Thanks, Steve. Hello, everyone. I have been allotted the extreme privilege of thanking our long, long, long time uh, MBCA board member, Ruth Riemann. If I were to list all of the contributions that Ruth has made over her several decades of service to MBCA and the Morongo Basin, we'd be here for a very long time. Ruth has such passion and dedication to the MBCA issues, our campaigns, our projects, and her work almost always formed a really rock solid basis for our successes, for many of our successes. Not the least of which is the Desert Wise Landscape Tour. Um, I know Ruth has spent thousands of hours uh, doing everything from editing the tour book to making phone calls to um, help find people to be on the tour, um, going to meetings, leading meetings, just her thousands and thousands of hours have made a real difference in the work that MBCA does. And I also wanted to talk about Ruth's public comments, um, whether they're written comments that we send in and she has shared with us, or whether they're the public comments that we make to the powers that be in those public comment sessions. Ruth has such a high quality of content, but also a certain intensity that really is a model for the rest of us in how to really make those uh, comments count. And I have to say personally, I definitely learned to be stronger in my comments from, from listening to and watching Ruth. Ruth and her husband, Steve Riemann, who played no small part in MBCA's uh, successes by supporting Ruth and also being a part of many of our um, events, uh, they have been dedicated to the best possible desert saving way of life or desert wise way of life in their own home since they moved here over 40 years ago. And they've, they've been so dedicated to doing things right in the desert. They truly live what they believe about preserving the desert environment while finding ways to live artfully and comfortably in the desert. So for me, Ruth has been a role model and an inspiration and I'm sure for all the other directors, board of directors, members that have ever worked with her. 
Uh, there's really a lot more that could be said, but Ruth, for now, we thank you and know that you'll be there in support of our work going on in the future because that's just who you are. But we do hope you'll enjoy some extra quiet time with Steve at your wonderful Desert Wise home. Thank you a million times over. Thank you, Ruth and Steve too. I woke up at three o'clock this morning and I wrote myself a note and I wanna share it with you. Thank you. Having lived here in this special place, since 1979 and served on the incredible MBCA board for a couple of decades. I know going forward, the trail is difficult for you all, but you will climb the steep grade. I'll be pushing from behind. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Ruth. Um, again, a million times over. And now I will go ahead, <laughs> Steve was gonna take that on, but I'll introduce Chris Clark of the National Parks Conservation Association. And he's also a well-known desert advocate. We know he's a lover of Joshua trees and uh, we will ask him also to be our moderator for the question and answer uh, after the two presentations. So take it over, Chris. Thank you, Lorraine and hello, good morning all. Uh, it's really nice to see some familiar names and uh, faces for those of you who have your cameras on. I hope you're all doing well and staying healthy. Uh, please, uh, please be careful. We need all of you intact, healthy, and able to uh, take those deep breaths as we face the work that's, uh, uh, that is to come in uh, 2022 and beyond. We are uh, all here essentially because of the Joshua trees today. And I mean, uh, in this meeting, but I also mean for a lot of us where we are, those of us who are in the Morongo Basin at the very least or near Joshua Tree National Park, uh, a lot of us are here in large part because of the trees. And it's, uh, it's fortunate for us as a region that we have this totemic plant species that um, really symbolizes the desert for us. Aside from the saguaro, there's no other species of plant that really says desert as, as much as Joshua trees do. And I, our appreciation for them runs really, really deep. Uh, we have extremely strong emotions about these trees as those of you who have been on social media recently with uh, development uh, efforts in, uh, in the Morongo Basin that involve illegal takes of Joshua trees, illegal now thanks to our keynote speaker um, in large part, uh, emotions run really high. People get really hot under the collar at threats to Joshua trees these days. And uh, that's a wonderful thing. Our appreciation for them is so deep that we even have folklore about the trees that we, uh, we repeat in sort of a, a loving kind of ritual at times. Things like the origins of the name, which show up in, uh, in press accounts of the tree. The, the story that uh, the tree got its name from uh, Mormon pioneers who were uh, pleased to see the uh, avatar, the prophet Joshua, pointing their way to a, the promised land. Like a lot of folklore, uh, that is based on a germ of fact, apparently. Uh, largely untrue as spoken, but it's a lovely, lovely story. Um, the uh, Mormons in Southwest Utah did refer to individual trees as the Joshua, uh, while the rest of us out in California and Nevada and Arizona sections of the desert, we're calling them yucca palms, which uh, is uh, another problematic name. We talk about the age of individual plants reaching thousands of years, or at least you know, high in the high in the triple digits, and uh, that's a I think a, an indicator of the respect with which we hold the trees in our hearts, and it's also largely untrue. It's extremely uncommon for an individual stem of Joshua tree to uh, surpass 250 years in age, which um, 
you know, as I get older, 250 years sounds pretty good, but it's still not all that old for a desert plant. Uh, the age of the species, you know, people uh, will sometimes refer to them as uh, lasting back to the age of the dinosaurs, and they certainly do have a sort of a prehistoric air to them. They are probably a younger species than us humans are, but uh, again, it's a, it's a measure of the respect. There is one piece of folklore that those of you who have uh, been acquainted with me for a little bit uh, know gets me a little hot under the collar, and that is the uh, uh, very well-intentioned uh, uh, statement that Joshua trees are not actually really trees, technically speaking, which is, uh, it's, it's a bit of misinformation. They are trees. Basically, I think my favorite definition of a tree that I've ever heard uh, is, comes from a, a forestry biologist, Tom Kimmerer, who told me a couple of years ago that his definition of a tree is he asks his four-year-old, presumably a six-year-old now, um, if something is a tree. And if she says yes, then it's a tree. Essentially, a tree is a plant that's shaped like a tree. And uh, Joshua trees certainly qualify, at least a lot of the time. Um, what Joshua trees are really outside of folklore is they're kind of a keystone species for a lot of different uh, desert organisms. They are uh, habitat for animals ranging from desert night lizards, at least the fallen branches of them are habitat to uh, cactus wrens and yucca moths, uh, letterback woodpeckers and flickers, uh, just any number of really, really wonderful uh, birds that use them as shelter or as perches from which to, uh, to hunt. We have uh, pack rats, desert wood rats that use them as a source of food and of moisture, They'll trim off the leaves. If you've ever been walking through a Joshua tree forest and you see one branch of a Joshua tree with all of its leaves shorn off, at like sort of like corn on the cob at a 4th of July picnic. That's the work of a desert pack rat, desert wood rat. They, uh, they're a symbol of the desert for us. They're a marker of home for a lot of us. But really what they are, are climate refugees. You hear a lot of talk about climate refugees uh, in human form. Uh, I kind of tend to toward the Kawaiisu definition of Joshua trees as a subset of humans, uh, people in the uh, uh, native people in the Western Mojave uh, felt a very, very strong affinity for the Joshua trees. I like that. I think of Joshua trees as climate refugees. Some of the earliest evidence we have of Joshua trees is from uh, paleontological data that showed them growing in the borderlands region around what is now Oregon Pipe. Cactus National Monument, um, which is actually another National Park Service holding uh, named after a particular species along with Joshua Tree National Park. And uh, if you're ever driving with, uh, with young folks, um, you might ask them to name all of the National Park Service units that are named after individual species of plant to see if they get them all. It can, uh, that'll get you from uh, Fresno to Visalia at the very least. And uh, it's clear that they don't grow down by Oregon pipe anymore. The desert was a lot cooler, a lot wetter back in the day. And Joshua trees, as the desert warmed over uh, the period from 15,000 years ago to about 8,000 years ago, they moved northward, they moved uphill. Uh, they used to grow in stands that were uh, dominated by pinion and juniper and other conifers. And with the exception of the very westernmost part of the Mojave, where there's a lot more water, a lot more moderate temperatures, they, uh, that community really no longer exists as much. Uh, you have Joshua trees growing uh, in a band essentially at the bottom and below the pinion and juniper band in the desert and conifers like white firs and other things are restricted to the uppermost parts of sky islands in the in the uh, uh, mountains 
in the desert. And that process is likely to have been continuing even without our help as the desert gets a little drier and a little warmer. Without our help in accentuating climate change, the Joshua tree would likely have been able to move uh, northward and uphill at a rate that would ensure its survival, at least in some places. We have uh, antelope ground squirrels and the major dispersers of Joshua trees seeds right now. They move about 100 feet in their entire lives, uh, except in places like uh, the settled parts of Joshua tree, like Panorama Heights, where they range from block after block and, you know, just going from one carefully tended garden to another. Uh, to devastate the plants, but uh, out, out in the wild desert, they don't travel quite as far. And so their uh, ability to disperse Joshua tree seed is very limited. If we weren't helping amp up the climate, uh, amp up the global temperature, they might still be able to move trees northward fast enough to survive, to make the species, the two species of Joshua trees survive. But we're helping things along. We've uh, come by and turned the, turned the heat up from two to about eight. And uh, there's no way Joshua trees are gonna be able to move northward to places like Fallon, Nevada and uh, Redding, California and uh, you know, Evanston, Wyoming fast enough uh, in order to survive. And so extraordinary measures are gonna need to be taken. One of the big problems, in fact, is that uh, along with Joshua trees, which really need climate situations like we don't have anymore, you know, cooler, wetter winters uh, in order to germinate successfully in the uh, more southern reaches of their habitat, uh, Joshua trees don't grow in a vacuum. There's uh, species like black brush, which are, uh, important nurse plants for Joshua trees, and they also are climate refugees in a lot of places. They, uh, coleogeny is, coleogeny's days are numbered in the Southern Mojave. Uh, you see in places in Joshua Tree National Park where there's been a fire and uh, it's like somebody came by with a uh, knife and scraped out the coleogeny along the, the lines where the fire was. And that's not gonna come back because black brush needs uh, five or six cool wet winters in a row in order to germinate and we don't get that pattern anymore. Uh, without coleogeny we don't really get Joshua tree seedlings all that successfully. Coleogeny still grows on Sema Dome where it hasn't burned and I think there's really no place that uh, expresses the promise and the threat to Joshua trees more starkly than Sema Dome. Sema Dome, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is uh, a climate refugium for the Joshua tree that's been identified in a bunch of different studies. Uh, it is uh, the crown jewel of Mojave National Preserve just to our north. Uh, it, it is Still, I, I talk about Sema Dome in the present tense a lot. Uh, it's not as accurate as it used to be, but Sema Dome is still the heart of the largest Joshua tree forest uh, in the world. It's the Eastern species of Joshua tree as opposed to the Western species, which Brendan has been working for protection of. Ecologically, the two species, as far as I know, are essentially identical in function. Uh, but there is that split that is still disputed, but increasingly accepted between the Western species, which we have here, and the Eastern species, which is more the Colorado River drainage. Sema Dome has been identified as a place where Joshua trees are likely to be able to survive even with our climate enhancements uh, well into the next century and beyond. And yet, even in that climate refugium, we lost 1.3 million Joshua trees in August, in August 2020. 
from the dome fire. Uh, the dome fire struck at the heart of the tree's habitat in one of the places that had been identified as the safest for Joshua trees, which really points up the importance of work to save Joshua trees, to protect them by any means that we can come up with. And it's hard, you know, SEMA Dome is an important place to me, just getting personal for a minute. Um, SEMA Dome is the reason that I live in the desert, the Joshua trees on SEMA Dome. Uh, long before I moved to the desert 14 years ago, I was visiting SEMA Dome every chance I got to commune with the Joshua trees there, to spend time with them, to learn about them, and to, uh, to just be with them. And there was a moment after the Hackberry fire, which was pretty traumatic uh, in 2005, a, a month after the Hackberry fire, I was standing at the edges of that burn scar with uh, a friend um, just on Cedar Canyon Road, for those of you who know the preserve, looking northward towards Sema Dome because I'd looked at burned desert long enough that day and I needed some, uh, some green or at least olive drab to refresh my, my vision. And I looked towards Teutonia Peak and Kessler Peak and the summit of Sema Dome at the stretch of uninterrupted black brush and creosote and Joshua trees and Mojave yuccas that stretch for miles and miles north. And I, what I saw was an uninterrupted carpet of vegetation that was flammable. And I thought to myself, the dome is going to burn. And I just hope I'm not around to see it. And uh, sadly, I was around to see it, though, uh, though that's, uh, that's not something that uh, we can change. And we can do our best to adapt to it, to protect other places that haven't burned yet to protect the species, to come up with ways to uh, restore and recover the uh, places that have burned, that have been damaged by other, uh, other disruptive influences ranging from fire to grazing to off-road vehicles to development to 25-year uh, lifespan solar projects. And it was with that in mind that I and Brendan uh, went up in December to take part in a small way in uh, helping to replant uh, Joshua trees in the burn area up on Cedar, uh, up, up on Sema Dome. And uh, I think it's really um, uh, kind of defines our friendship you know uh, there's there was some hiking involved some some travel and joshua trees and that's pretty much the nature of our friendship uh brendan and i actually met in person for the first time in 2011 at the uh i tell people that uh, we met at the uh, public interest environmental law conference in eugene uh it was actually in mcmenamin's pub uh in Eugene, which uh, essentially the Eugene Environmental Law Conference is a means by which uh, activists from around the West get together and have an excuse to do a bunch of drinking and, uh, uh, and exchange information and network. But Brendan and I actually, are, our um, non-real-time relationship goes back a little bit before that. Uh, he was kind enough to consent to me reprinting something of his in a publication I ran in 2011, uh, which I think was the first time we ever spoke. Uh, and we uh, have decided over the years that we were probably at individual demonstrations in Berkeley and Oakland uh, for as long as far back as the mid 80s without realizing it. Uh, so uh, our involvement uh, tangential as it may have been back then goes back a long ways. Um, as conservation director of the Center for Biological Diversity and the person whose petition uh, to the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, resulted in uh, the current level of protection that the Western Joshua Tree has, Brendan has worked on a protection of a lot 
of different things, including environmental activists. He was uh, instrumental in the uh, extremely belated uh, uh, acquirement of justice for our mutual friend Judy Berry in her suit against the FBI. He has worked on species ranging from uh, polar bears and attempts to protect them with uh, legal tools, including the Endangered Species Act, to the uh, extremely threatened vaquita, uh, the porpoise species that is possibly still in the uh, northern uh, Gulf of California. And he's just one of the most effective environmental activists around and has shaped not only uh, the future of the Western Joshua Tree, but also uh, the course of action of the Center for Biological Diversity, which is uh, a, a, an organization that is well worth uh, your support. And in addition to uh, hitting up the MBCA website, I encourage you to go check out CBD's website if you're not a, a member and, and make sure and join there. I'm hoping to get him on my podcast, 90 Miles from Needles, at some point in the next couple of months. And I'm just extremely pleased to introduce my friend, Brendan Cummings, to talk about Western Joshua Tree. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, um, for that. And I, I could e easily spend much of uh, my allotted time reciprocating about all the great things that Chris has done and continues to do. Um, but many of you already know that. Um, I, I assume those, can you thumbs up if you can see the opening slide, the cover slide of my presentation showing? Great. Well, good morning, everyone. And you know, thank you, Chris. Thanks also to MBCA for inviting me to give this presentation. And really thanks to all of you, not just for attending, but for all the desert conservation work that you all do. About a year and a half ago, I submitted a petition to protect the Western Joshua Tree under the California Endangered Species Act, or CESA. Today, I'll discuss why I did so, what I think the consequences of such a listing might be, and what we all can do to help protect the Joshua Tree. Years ago, I did a lot of desert conservation work, but I eventually got distracted. What took me away was climate change. I helped write the petition and led the legal effort that forced the Bush administration to protect the polar bear as a threatened species under the Federal Endangered Species Act. This was the first species protected, recognized as threatened or endangered due to the threat of climate change. I did this while living in Joshua Tree. And while I was loosely following the science on the climate threat to Joshua trees and saw firsthand the loss of habitat from development of fire, in my heart, I didn't really believe that they were truly threatened. There are millions of them, spanning millions of acres across four states, much of it protected in national parks. If Joshua trees were endangered, wasn't everything endangered? So what's changed? A few things. When working on polar bears 15 years ago, climate was largely viewed as a future threat. That's no longer the case. It's here and it's already devastating the planet including the Mojave. This slide highlights a couple recent studies documenting the collapse of the bird fauna in the Mojave. In essence, if you count the number of bird species at any given site in the desert, you only see about 50% of what you would have seen 50 years ago. Why? It's a lot hotter than it was in 1970. And birds need either more water or more energy, food, to cool themselves, both of which are in short supply. I could show you similar slides about all manner of species. Climate change is here, and it will only get worse, at least in the near term. And even if we do everything right with greenhouse emissions, it's still going to get a lot hotter over the coming decades, even in the most optimistic scenarios. Back to Joshua trees. In the past 15 or so years, there's been a lot of great science produced about Joshua trees which cumulatively convinced me that they are in fact threatened. One area of such science is taxonomy. As Chris alluded to, there are two, 
two varieties have long been described, but it wasn't until 2007 that they were elevated to separate species. It took more than a decade after that before people, including most researchers, started to accept it. And it's still not 100% accepted. They look different, with the Western trees tending to be more tree-like with a singular trunk, while Eastern ones tend to branch out more in a V-shape. They have different flowers, they have different fruits, and perhaps most importantly, they have different pollinating moths. One of the coolest things is that the length of the ovipositor of each moth, the part of the body it uses to lay eggs, matches the length of the stylar canal in the flower of its respective host species. In some, the two species geographically, morphologically, and gen genetically distinct with different obligate moths. So where do they reside? The green areas here are the range of the Western Joshua tree, while the other colors are the Eastern species. Western species is predominantly in California, extending a little bit into Nevada. Trees here in Joshua Tree National Park, again, as Chris mentioned, and throughout the Morongo Basin are Western trees. And the trees in the Mojave Preserve, Sima Dome, are the Eastern species. I'm going to mainly talk about the Western species, but I will return to the Eastern one near the end. Again, as Chris mentioned, one thing that's not just interesting, but of conservation importance, is that the range of Joshua trees was greater at the end of the ice ages than it is today. The map shows the range 11,000 years ago, the black line extending into Mexico, and the current range, the brown shaded areas. You'll notice that the range shrunk hundreds of miles from the south. It did not expand a comparable distance north. Why is that? Some scientists, and this is debated, have theorized that Joshua tree relied upon large animals that are now extinct, such as the Sasta ground sloth as seed dispersers. When those animals went extinct, Joshua trees were left with much smaller seeds dispersers. Today, the antelope ground squirrel, as Chris mentioned, is the most important seed disperser. And the range and rate at which those animals can assist is to high elevations or cooler habitats just cannot keep pace with current warming. But not only has the Joshua trees range significantly since the ice age, but has also suffered greatly from more recent events basically people cutting them down to make way for farms or houses or freeways or all other sorts of purposes. In this slide, you see me next to a Western Joshua tree that is about as big as you will find today. You might find some a little larger, but a hundred years ago, there were at least some Joshua trees that were far bigger. This tree was particularly popular as it was near a road west of Lancaster. But in 1930, it was burned by vandals, generating outrage, including a reward offered by Minerva Hoyt. And that helped fuel the desert protection activism, ultimately leading to the 1936 creation of Joshua Tree National Monument. And you notice Joshua Tree National Monument was not in the Lancaster area where this was. What happened to the giant Joshua trees of the West? Mojave, much of the land was rapidly developed, first for farms, then for urban development. This is Lancaster area in 1988. And again in 2018, you'll see the farming style has changed. It's filled in a lot. And the other big difference is the rise of solar fields on the Western edge of it. Um, much of this area was once Joshua Tree woodlands. And such activities continue to the present day. And that loss of habitat to development is projected to only accelerate. About 40% of the range of the Western Joshua Tree in California is on private land. This map is an official federal document that projects virtually all the currently unprotected private land in the Morongo Basin, West Mojave, and Antelope Valley will be developed for housing. That's the gray areas on the map. So is the Western Joshua tree threatened? If you only consider habitat loss from development, they certainly are of some significant conservation concern. 
That's why even absent endangered species protections, state law and local ordinances provide them some nominal protection. You're not supposed to remove them without permits from the county or Yucca Valley or whatever local jurisdiction involved. But if development were the only threat, I probably wouldn't consider them clearly threatened or endangered. But of course, it's not the only threat. The threats to Western Joshua trees fall into three broad categories. Um, climate change, fire, and the related thing, of, which is fueled by invasive grasses, and development. And while those threats are a problem for all species, the Joshua tree has some unique life history traits that make it particularly vulnerable. In discussing the life history of Joshua trees, it's important to note that the different studies over the years come up with pretty varying estimates of age, life expectancy, and growth rate of Joshua trees. This likely due to different locations, times, and durations of the studies, but also in significant part due to the fact that they lack annual growth rings that many other tree species have, making them very difficult to age. But that fact, as Chris made clear, doesn't mean they are not trees. Anyway, the main numbers here are mostly from a long-term USGS study. They can live upwards of 30, 300 years. Um, that one study said maybe 5% make it that high, um, but average life expectancy is only about 90. Although another study says about 150 might be the life expectancy. Again, there's debate in these numbers, um, but they're all ballpark. But, and who knows how old the giant trees near Lancaster were when they were killed. They grow slowly, on average a bit over three centimeters a year, but again, that varies by location and year. And you can get a three centimeter annual average with a zero, zero, and a nine each year over three years. So they don't grow at a steady rate. Top out at about five to 12 meters, usually on the low end of that. Big tree in the early photo was over 20 meters tall. And importantly, it takes about 30 years before they reach flowering age. Assuming a Joshua tree survives long enough to flower, successful reproduction is not easy. They only flower in certain years. You all may remember that the storms of late 2018 led to it seeming like virtually every Joshua tree in the Mojave flowered in the spring of 2019. In 2020, I didn't see a single Joshua tree flower. Last year, my very anecdotal calculation around here was about maybe one in 10 adult trees flowered and only some of the branches did. If they flower, they need to be pollinated by the moth and not just any moth, the very specific species they rely upon. Assuming that happens, seeds are produced, they need to be dispersed by rodents without all of them being eaten. In other words, an antelope squirrel needs to either forget where it buried the seeds or someone else needs to eat the squirrel before it finishes off its cache. Studies show that fewer than 1% of seeds produce seedlings and that a lucky seedling needs to be under the shelter of a nurse plant, such as a black brush, to have any hope of surviving. Then the rabbits eat them. In one study, in a single dry year, jackrabbits wiped out more than half the seedlings in the study area. You know, I do a lot of ocean work as well, and I'm not sure who has it worse, a Joshua tree seedling or a sea turtle hatchling, but the odds of going from seedling to adult is very, very low. As one researcher from the USGS who did this study summarized, the convergence of events for successful reproduction probably only occurs a few times a century. And that was in you know, the theoretically normal world of the past century, not the superheated climate of today. All these traits make Joshua trees particularly vulnerable to climate change. If I were doing this presentation 15 years ago, I would be explaining the greenhouse effect, show you multiple graphs of rising CO2 levels and corresponding temperature increase, and otherwise try to convince you that climate change is really something to be concerned about. I don't think I need to do that anymore. We're all experiencing it already. Last July was the hottest month globally in human history. June 2021 was the hottest June in California history. That same month, San Bernardino County was eight degrees Fahrenheit, about four and a half Celsius above the long-term average. The heat dome that seared the Pacific Northwest this summer was the most anomalous extreme heat event 
ever observed on Earth. It was so out of what was expected. You know, scientists didn't even know what to do with it. This week, Big Sur, an area we think of as one of the wettest parts of California, is on fire in January. I could go on and on. The climate is warming rapidly, but that warming is not evenly distributed. Globally, we've already warmed over one degree C, but in the counties where Western Joshua trees occur, we've warmed between 1.7 and 2.3 degrees. And remember, the goal of the Paris Agreement is to keep warming, average globally, to 1.5 degrees, and at the very most, two degrees. So we're already locally exceeding, or at least approaching, dangerous levels. Also note, and this will be important later, in the next 20 years, daily maximum temperatures in the desert may rise by more than three degrees Celsius. Climate change is not only temperature, but also precipitation or lack thereof. There's some debate as to whether we will get an average more or less rain here in the Mojave, but there is unanimity that there will be an increase in variability, some really wet years or months, some really dry years or months, with more extreme and prolonged droughts. In California, December was one of our wettest on record. This January is very close to being our driest January on record. So what does drought do to the Joshua trees? 1999 was the start of extreme drought in the Mojave that lasted several years, and it killed a lot of Joshua trees. There were also fires, and we'll get to that. But even in unburned areas, in study plots in Joshua Tree National Park, 26% of unburned trees died between 1999 and 2004. The smaller trees died first, with some mid-sized and larger trees dying later. They were killed by a mix of water stress itself, as well as herbivory by pocket gophers and other rodents, likely turned to Joshua Tree stems, roots, and bark as alternative food sources due to the lack of anything else to eat. These are photos not from that drought, from, but from 2021, across the range of the Western Joshua Tree, where a similar dynamic may be occurring based on the current drought. Climate change is already affecting Joshua trees. So are Western Joshua trees already declining? Short answer, yes. Putting aside the undisputable declines caused by habitat loss to development or fire, they appear to also be declining both by adult mortality as well as reduced recruitment on otherwise protected habitat. At least that's the case in places where studies have been done such as Joshua Tree National Park and Red Rock Canyon State Park. And of course, these declines are projected to get worse. These are a few of the recent published studies predicting severe declines of Joshua trees. This slide from a 2012 study shows the projected declines in Joshua Tree National Park. There's a couple noteworthy points. Adult trees are tougher than juveniles. The adult trees we see today were recruited into a population, the population under a climate that no longer exists, a climate that was about one degree C cooler than present. The current range of juvenile trees, depending on how you map it, is about half that of adults. In other words, even if all further warming magically stopped at current levels tomorrow, as the adult trees age out and die and are replaced by the current younger trees, the distribution of Joshua trees in the park would be cut by about half. Of course, warming is not stopping tomorrow. Additionally, the 90 plus percent decline in the worst case scenario in this study modeled a three degree rise in summer maximum temperature. In 2012, that projection was latter half of this century. The official California climate assessment from 2018 predicts that such an increase could occur in the Mojave as early as 2040, less than 20 years from now. This is from a 2019 publication, which was similar to the previous study, but a lot more data and ground truth, showing current distribution in the upper left and the different emission scenarios. In the best case emission scenario on the upper right, Joshua trees still lose over 80% of their range in the park. With current emissions trajectories, they lose essentially all of their range. 
the more we study Joshua trees, the more we realize how vulnerable they are. Opponents of protecting, say those studies are just in Joshua Tree National Park, they'll do fine elsewhere. Not so. This range-wide study clearly shows and it predicts that Western Joshua trees are on a trajectory to lose virtually their entire range in California, as shown by the red areas. Other more optimistic colors in the map are largely of the Eastern species. And even the green areas are not where Joshua trees will persist, but areas that might become suitable for the trees if we plant them there. Without intervention, we will likely lose the Western species almost entirely. And if you look more closely at the map, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this orange area, the orange areas are where Joshua trees are projected to survive warming. This is leaf flat up here um, on the Western edge of Death Valley. It is also, is one of, you know, thought to be one of the Joshua tree strongholds. It is also where one of those pictures showing rodent damaged trees was taken last year. Highest elevation area right next to Leaf Flat, um, that is a protected refugia, is conglomerate Mesa, where a gold mine is proposed. And this big orange spot in the Mojave Preserve, that's Cima Dome. The curse of studying Joshua trees is that knowledge destroys beauty. I used to see nothing but magic here. Now I see a carpet of invasive grasses that threatens the entire ecosystem. I could do a whole talk on invasive grasses, but the short version is that non-native grasses fertilized by nitrogen from smog blowing in from the LA basin has taken over the Mojave Desert in the past 30 or so years, totally altering the natural fire regime in the desert. Where once we had small fires, we now have mega fires. This is the Mojave Desert Land Trust Gateway property, section 33, a portion of which burned in 2000. These areas, all legally protected land in the West Mojave, also burned in 2020. This is Sima Dome. Fire, driven by invasive grasses, has increased dramatically in the Mojave in recent decades. More areas burned in 2005 alone than the 25 previous years combined. And last year was a horrible year for fire. These areas I just showed, County Preserve, Land Trust, National and State Parks, all containing Joshua trees, burned in 2000, 2000 summer and fall. Existing protected lands for Joshua trees are not enough. And if it seems that Joshua trees are getting disproportionately hit, they are. The greatest concentrations of fires in the California desert have occurred in the core areas of the Western Joshua tree. And most Joshua trees die post fire. While they do, many of them resprout if the conditions are, are good, um, those resprouts generally don't survive with some studies showing over 90% mortality. And the areas where Joshua trees are most likely to survive warming are also the more fire vulnerable areas. This map shows fires that have already burned in Joshua Tree National Park, overlaid with projected refugia under the most optimistic climate scenario. There really is no safe refuge. Based on all this, in October 2019, I petitioned the California Fish and Game Protect Commission to protect Western Joshua trees under the California Endangered Species Act. This is a 75 page or so document I drafted summarizing the science and threats related to Joshua trees. You can download it from your website or email it me and I'll share it with you if you want to read it. I'm convinced that the Western Joshua tree is imperiled, but is the, does that mean that it is legally threatened or endangered under state law? In both federal and state law, we have threatened categories and endangered species categories. An endangered species is one that is currently at high risk of extinction, 
It could happen quickly. The risks are usually imminent. In contrast, a threatened species is one that by definition is not yet endangered, but is likely to become so in the foreseeable future. The threats facing Joshua trees from climate change, fire, and development are completely foreseeable, all too foreseeable. I think the species as a matter of science and law should be listed as threatened. Hopefully the state will agree with me. The CISA listing process is a multi-step process bouncing back and forth between the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the California Fish and Game Commission. The department implements and enforces CISA and makes recommendations to the commission as to whether the species qualifies for listing. The important dates to note here are October 9th, 2020, when the Western Joshua tree officially became a candidate species, giving it interim protection. At that point, it became illegal for anyone in California to kill or move a Western Joshua tree without a state permit. And I'll come back to that. The upcoming dates are the most important. April 9th is the deadline for the department to make its recommendation as to whether to protect the species or not. And at the meeting in June, the commission will vote on whether to permanently protect the species based largely upon the department's recommendation. The June date could change, um, but I've heard their, their intent is to meet that deadline. And it's unclear whether it will be via Zoom or in person. Um, if in person, fortunately, based on the schedule of the commission, it'll probably be in the LA area. Um, and we'll keep you up to date on that. So what does it mean when a species is listed as threatened? This pr presentation is getting a little long, so I'm gonna speed through these slides, but you can roughly break down the effects of listing into affirmative mandates and prohibitions. The affirmative mandates apply generally to state agencies and they are to conserve the species by acquiring land, developing a recovery plan, and taking other similar conservation actions. The prohibitions that tend to have the most effect is the prohibition on taking, which basically means killing or taking into possession, moving an individual of a listed species. And species are defined, listed at, plants and animals are defined not just as a thing, but any part thereof. So this applies not just to a whole Joshua tree, but a part of one. So trimming a branch of a tree or digging up roots would be considered take of the species. But all prohibitions have exceptions in permitting processes. Among these are ones for plants possessed prior to listing. In other words, prior to October 9th, 2020, this would apply to a nursery or some similar, you know, MDLT's um, garden. Um, take can also author, be authorized by via a memorandum of understanding with DFW for scientific or other purposes. The commission can also exempt take via regulations issued during the time the species is a candidate, which is right now. These are called 2084 regulations based on the Fish and Game Code section. For Joshua trees, they did this for three types of activities. 15 shovel-ready solar projects in Kern and San Bernardino County, for hazard tree trimming and dead tree removal for anyone needing it, and for single family home and infrastructure projects by participating jurisdictions. And only Palmdale and Yucca Valley ultimately signed up for this option. A few things to note here. The hazard tree permits are free. The other two require payments of mitigation fees based on the number and size of Joshua trees moved or killed. Importantly, San Bernardino County initially was part of a process to get the single family home exemption, but walked away from it at last minute. So, that, so while it is easy and relatively cheap to get a permit in Yucca Valley to move a Joshua tree or even kill one, it is difficult and expensive to do so here in Joshua Tree or anywhere else in San Bernardino County because of the county's decision. Um, and I, I would say, you know, as to be, Frank, over the years, about Joshua Tree, as a Joshua Tree resident, we always think we're better at protecting our desert than Yucca Valley as we watch the growth of Yucca Valley. But I really want to give credit to Yucca Valley. They realized the listing was happening. They proactively got involved in setting up this permitting regime. And um, as near as I can tell, it's mostly working. Um, and 
you know, it's people are avoiding Joshua trees, people are moving them with certified arborists in the right way. You know, I'm sure we can find things to critique about it, but it actually is working pretty good. I wish the county overall had done the same thing. But what that means is you have these two parallel worlds where in Yucca Valley, it's regulated and working. And in Joshua Tree, any Joshua Tree that's been removed since October 2020, that's been illegally removed and that's a felony. And we can come back to that in Q&A or whatever later. Anyway, onward. Take can be authorized, also be authorized by what are known as incidental take permits, sometimes called 2081 permits. Such a permit requires the impacts of species to be minimized and fully mitigated. They can be sought on any scale, ranging from individual property owner, larger development project, even the entire city or county. Um, the costs and requirements vary with the scale of the project. Importantly, the 2084 only applies during candidacy. So if Joshua Tree is listed later this summer, 2081 is the prime mechanism that uh, permits will be authorized in, under. Um, I expect this document from 2005 looks to, familiar to at least some of you. You can even see the County of San Bernardino's logo on it. More than 30 years ago, the desert tortoise was listed under both state and federal Endangered Species Act. Clark County in Nevada and the St. George area of Utah developed habitat conservation plans, or HCPs, for the species, as did the Coachella Valley. But this is the closest we got one for the tortoise in the high desert. Even though it was almost incomplete, the counties and developers walked away from the HCP because they felt it required too much conservation. They gambled the state and feds would not enforce the take prohibition for anything other than the largest projects. Unfortunately, they were right. Hundreds of thousands of acres of desert tortoise habitat were developed or fragmented. Virtually every project's environmental report would say something along the lines of, while this area is considered suitable habitat for tortoise, no animals were found on site. The bulldozers would roll and thousands of tortoises over these past three decades were buried in their dens. No avoidance, no mitigation. The tortoise and Western Joshua tree overlap in significant part, particularly in the areas subject to development. The difference is a tortoise is cryptic. You don't know if one's on a given parcel, but you can't hide a Joshua tree or deny it occurs on a development site. It's one of the first listed species that you can literally see from space via satellite images. This prospect of CESA protection for the Western Joshua tree has made local jurisdictions and developers realize that their three decade free pass from the ESA and CESA may be coming to an end. And importantly, unlike the federal ESA, threatened plants are protected from take, killing, under CESA. As I've mentioned, CESA contains exemptions that allow otherwise prohibited take. One such path is a natural communities conservation plan that is roughly the state equivalent of a federal HCP. While most of the rest of Southern California has completed NCCPs, the high desert was, has not. An NCCP done right could lead to landscape scale, climate informed planning in the Mojave that ideally would result in large increases of protected land for the Western Joshua tree and by extension, the tortoise. In imagining a conservation reserve designed for the Western Joshua tree under both CESA and the emerging 30 by 30 lens, one thing that comes to mind is what we have done for another of California's iconic trees. If you have driven up Highway 101 in Northern California, you have seen signs for Redwood National and State Parks. It's a patchwork of st state and federal protected areas. I can envision a Joshua Tree National and State Parks running from Joshua Tree National Park in the south, along the backside of the San Bernardino and San Gabriel Mountains into the Antelope Valley, then up the Eastern Sierra and over to Death Valley. Many of these pieces already exist and already are protected. We just need to stitch them together by protecting the lands in between. So at the end of the day, do I have hope for the Western Joshua Tree? I do, I do. Frankly, I'm much more optimistic about it than the polar bear. 
notwithstanding its vulnerable life history traits, the species is relatively long lived. You know, even if that's only 200 years or so, or 100 years or so, that's enough time for us to solve the climate crisis and turn things around if we can keep those trees alive. Those adult trees are relatively resilient, you know, fragile, but we can do it. The species has a relatively large current distribution spread across elevational and latitudinal gradients. So we've got a lot to work with. Some of its range is in already protected areas. Majority of its range is in federal lands where protections and better management is possible so long as we have a willing administration. And it's a plant that's relatively easy to grow from seed and potentially head start a transplant. You know, you can't really grow polar bear cubs in a zoo and plop them out on the ice and expect them to survive. But you probably can do that with Joshua trees if you do it right and carefully. And as for fire, which is one of the biggest threats, you know, that's hard. But one of the things um, that gives me hope, the nitrogen fueling the invasive grasses, that comes from smokestacks and tailpipes. And the very same things we need to address greenhouse gases, the CO2, is the same thing to address the nitrogen. The electrification of our vehicle fleet, the tr transition to 100% renewable energy will reduce the rate of uh, nitrogen deposition, and that will start to make it possible to address these invasive plants and change the fire regime in the desert. But most importantly, as, as Chris so well said, the species is that's an iconic and people want to save it. And where there is that will and desire, I truly believe there is a way. So what can we do? First off, we need to get it listed. Um, all of you will want to write the Fish and Game Commission and let them know you support CESA protection when the comment window opens, likely in April. Attend via phone, web, or in person if necessary, the upcoming commission meeting in June and testify in support of protection. And not just yourself, but hopefully we can mobilize, you know, hundreds or more people to weigh in into that process because there will be a lot of opposition from developers and others. Um, if you're a desert resident, which almost everyone here is, contact your local government, urge them to support Joshua Tree Protection through the CESA listing and development of an NCCP. Um, support groups working to protect Joshua trees, such as around the Basin Conservation Association, NPCA, and others. Um, and as Chris said, volunteer on science, restoration, or advocacy efforts related to Joshua trees. You know, the, the big studies that showed the impacts of Joshua trees in Joshua Tree National Park relied in significant part on citizen silence, volunteers helping measure and track and count the Joshua trees. So none of this protection effort would have been possible without those volunteers. And what we're seeing in SEMA Dome is, is really something sort of historic. It's one of the first places where sort of proactive climate adaptation is being tried. And it's really on you know a micro scale right now, but it's gonna, you know, the little seedling of that uh, effort will ideally grow into a large tree of such efforts over the years. Um, and it really marks sort of a phase shift, I think, in the National Park Service, which, you know, rightfully, their base thing is leave it alone. But in a world of runaway climate change, sometimes you have to be a little more active and interventionist and uh, restoration activities. So another one of those restoration plannings is scheduled for March. Um, that was really a great thing to participate in. But, you know, and probably the most important thing, which sounds the most cliche, but is fundamentally the most necessary in the United States, is demand politicians enact meaningful climate policies. Um, you know, we're such a big part of the problem, we have to change it here in the United States. And CO2 concentrations increase each year. You know, it can, it can be depressing or dispiriting. And the Joshua tree is becoming a symbol of our failure to address climate change. But I really believe that with early protection, you know, collaborative effort, wise planning, it can instead become an example of how we actually acted to protect our biodiversity and by extension, our economy and our communities in the face of climate change. And um, 
yeah, I'm glad all of you people are here with me on that journey and attempt to do so. So I'll end it there. And if lastly, if anything I discussed today wasn't ambitious enough, this is what I'm really aiming to do, uh, bring back the sloth. So thanks and happy to take any questions. And I am going to be uh, moderating or curating questions uh, that you may have. If you, uh, for those of you familiar with Zoom, please put questions in the chat. Uh, if this is your first or second time on Zoom, uh, down at the bottom of your window, there will be a little uh, a little icon that says chat. Uh, just click on that, and the chat window should appear on the margin of the window and you can type in questions there. I will, uh, just because I have the mic, uh, I will add that the next episode of the podcast 90 Miles from Needles will be covering the dome fire and have an extensive interview with uh, Mojave Preserve botanist Drew Kaiser who headed up the, um, the re vegetation effort and intends to continue that for the next several years in the fall. So for more information on that, uh, I am putting my own podcast web address in the chat. Check that out uh, after the 1st of February and you'll get a lot more information there. Um, got a couple of good questions in uh, already. And uh, there's another one from Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, the first one, uh, Brendan, I people ask me about the just sort of general attempt to protect Joshua trees writ large with uh, federal listing that Wild Earth Guardians has, uh, has pursued and is continuing to pursue and your petition with California. And uh, I misspoke uh, earlier when I said it was a petition to the uh, Department of Fish and Game. It was the Fish and Game Commission, as you, as you pointed out. But um, I've, uh, I have a problem in answering the question of you know, what is the overall attempt to protect the Joshua tree without getting really, really deep into the weeds, uh, which is a trait of mine. Uh, I wonder if you have a, sort of a more elevator version of, uh, you know, the difference between state and federal protection and why, uh, why both are important, but why you chose state protection as the way you went. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Chris. And and on, on the question of how CISA works versus federal works, I could do a whole hour long on that as well, but so I'll try to be brief. And if I'm rambly, cut me off. Um, so CISA protection and, and federal ESA um, have a lot of overlap in what they do, but there's some major distinctions. So under CISA, um, under both, you can protect species as threatened or endangered. Um, under both, you can protect both animals and plants. One of the important distinctions is um, under CISA, plants get the protection from take. Um, and so federal protection generally, and I'll can go into more detail, the generally take is not prohibited of a federally listed species under federal law. You know, there may be other prohibitions that protect it, you know, things on BLM land that say no collecting or, or whatnot. Um, but so the take prohibition under state law is stronger. Um, one of the issues that's often asked is, what about on federal land? Does CISA apply on federal land? And the Western Joshua Tree, a little bit, a little over 50% of it is on federal land. And the answer is um, yes, in some circumstances. So the, on federal land, federal activities in general are exempt from um, state law. So if Joshua Tree National Park wants to put in a new parking lot or campground, it does not need a permit from the state to do so, even if it's gonna move or kill Joshua trees. However, in uh, except for areas of federal land that are of exclusive federal jurisdiction, and there's only one place in California that is, and this is through its weird history, 
outside of Yosemite National Park, which is an area of exclusive jurisdiction, why there's a federal jail in Yosemite, um, but there's no Joshua trees there, so it's not relevant here. So everywhere else in the state on federal land, state law applies to non-federal actors. So for instance, um, solar project on Edwards Air Force Base. If the Air Force was building a project by itself using contractors to power the base, they would be exempt from state law. But leasing out land to Terragen to build a commercial solar project to feed into the grid, Terragen has to comply with state law. So for large scale solar projects uh, that we might see even on federal land, they would have to comply with CESA and get take permits for Joshua Tree. So the, the CESA take pr prohibition is um, really strong. Um, for federal, the, and one other thing with CESA is endangered and threatened species, even though there's different thresholds for getting protection, they receive the same protection once listed. For federally listed species, one thing the ESA has that CESA lacks is what's known as the Section 7 consultation provision. This requires federal agencies, such as BLM or the Forest Service, to ensure through consultation with the US Fish and Wildlife Service that their activities do not jeopardize a species or destroy its critical habitat. So this is a process that requires analysis, a look before you leap kind of thing. And it's one of the main mechanisms on federal land, how decisions are improved or are diverted. But jeopardize, you're looking at the species level. Is this gonna push it closer towards extinction? The section seven doesn't protect the individual plant. So if you had a, say for example, which you might be hearing about next week, a rare endemic uh, like the Inyo rock daisy were protected under federal law, um, building a mine on conglomerate mesa in its habitat would likely jeopardize it. Um, if it were also simultaneously protected under state law, the mining company could not kill any individuals of the plant when doing their activity without permit. So the two can complement each other. Um, one other thing that would be a benefit of federal listing is federal listing for plants um, provide, the law provides protection for additional protections for endangered plants, but not threatened. Joshua trees are highly unlikely to get listed as endangered threatening, federally. They might get listed as threatened. The federal protect, the, the endangered plants, their main protections, you know, a lot of the ESA listing for plants was like orchid thieves and things like that. So it's all about the trade of species, not habitat protection. But what they do have is a prohibition to remove and reduce to possession from federal land i.e. cactus poaching or things of that sort. Not really much of an issue for Joshua trees. So you're not violating the federal ESA if you mow down a Joshua tree and mulch it in place and don't take it, even if, they, if it were listed as endangered. Um, you know, so that take prohibition wouldn't stop, say, a solar project or some other thing on federal land. Um, but endangered plants also have a provision where it's a violation of federal law if you're taking a plant in violation of state law. Um, so if we get the Joshua Tree state listed and it also gets federally listed as endangered, which is a high threshold to clear, um, it gives certain extra angles of, of protection. Um, threatened species, I, I can really go into the weeds on this, but there is a, was a blanket rule applying some protections to all threatened species. The Trump administration eliminated that rule. So say if the Joshua tree were listed as threatened under the federal ESA this year or next year, it would get no take prohibitions at all. Um, but it could, a friendly administration could it, attach some such protections. Anyway, I could go deeper and deeper into the weeds, but um, the, I would say the other most important thing 
is the state process, even though it feels totally drawn out to me, actually moves pretty fast and will be completed in about two and a half years from petition to final listing. The federal process, while there are timelines to do so, nothing ever goes that fast. Everything requires litigation to push things along. And from petition to actual final listing, if you're lucky, it takes four years. There are some species it's taken us 20 years to get them through the federal system. So um, I think Joshua trees, um, at least the Western ones, will probably ultimately get federally listed. But I don't think that will come till 2025 or so. And who knows what federal administration that will be. And so 2028, 2029. Um, so it's not something we can count on as, as something that'll, you know, with regulatory impact in the near term versus CISA will. Um, and I'll pause there and happy to answer why Western versus Eastern if, as a separate question if someone is, wants that answer. Yep, and I, I expect we'll get to that. In in the meantime, uh, Steve and Janet have asked a couple of related questions that I'll I'll try and uh, combine. Um, how is CDFW reacting to um, to reports of illegal take of Joshua trees? Uh, do you have a sense of you know how many permits have been applied for? What just what is how, how well equipped is CDFW to deal with um, the uh, this new responsibility that they have, and uh, you know what's your sense of that? Yeah, very good question. And it's um, if you asked me about a year ago, I'd be highly frustrated. Of like, you call up the the tip line and the wardens, and they're like, Joshua Trees, talk to the county; they're in charge. And it's like, no, you're you're now in charge. Um, it, it's, there's been a concerted effort among the wardens to educate the wardens on it, realize that this, you know, they are protected, that if they get tips on it, they should take action, um, and, um, to do so. My understanding, you know, there is, uh, like one high, semi-high profile, uh, prosecution, um, done, um, for incident in Joshua Tree where um, people had to pay a fine. You know, that one was pretty egregious. They, you know, cut them down, dug a hole, buried them to hide the fact that they did it. And um, so there's a couple large scale ones that my understanding are currently being investigated, you know, where, you know, if you remove dozens or hundreds of trees, you're gonna, you're gonna get cited, possibly arrested, and hopefully prosecuted. If it's something smaller than that, you know, one of the one of the issues we have with environmental crimes more broadly is um, that getting prosecutors' attention. Um, you know, there's so many things of like, oh, someone dug up a baby plant and you want me to prosecute them for a felony um, when look at everything else that I need to deal with. So, um, so there, the structure sort of pushes, even though the actual penalties, if enforced, you know, a year in jail, twenty-five to fifty thousand dollar fine, that would be per tree, um, can be pretty steep, and it's a felony. Um, we're we're unlikely to see a total, you know, crackdown that way. But we, I, I think also, you know, the fact that even though it's illegal right now and they're a candidate they're a candidate there's a little bit of this holding pattern of like how strict do you be how harsh do you crack down because will it all go away in six months time um and um so i think once listing is finalized assuming it is finalized um there will be more um rigorous enforcement and, and one thing you know like I think a lot of anyone living locally in the desert, you see like, hmm, how did that lot get bladed and not touch a Joshua tree? It seems improbable that the geometry would work out that they could fit a place there um, without a permit. One of the things with Joshua trees that I mentioned before is you can see them from space and with high, there's a lot more high resolution satellite imagery out there. Um, the, 
um, statute of limitations, my understanding is three years. So, you know, even if you cut them down on a, the day after it was illegal, you're, there's still a year and a half or more where you could get potentially prosecuted. And I've been, well, won't say too much, but looking at um, generating sample areas of high resolution uh, time sequence to basically document how much actual Joshua, illegal Joshua tree removal there is and assemble that information um, for the state attorney general or, and the wardens. Um, so people who, got a, who think they may, got away with it haven't necessarily gotten away with it. Um, Do you have a sense of how many permits have been uh, applied for with CDFW? Yeah, it, it's, there, there's two different types. So there's um, the, um, there's the ones under the 2084. And so they've been issuing a fair number of the hazard permits and that system, my understanding is going smoothly. Um, of the solar projects, 15 were grandfathered in, 13 actually took advantage of it. Um, I've, um, I have, I'm waiting for public records response, but I was told that there's only been, um, you know, maybe a dozen or so take applications um, that have gone in. So some are for additional renewable energy projects. Some are for development projects. There's a huge amount of development happening in the Victor Valley, you know, Hesperia, Apple Valley. Um, and that's where we're seeing some of the permits. Um, the, the permits are issued by regional offices of DFW. So there's a, there, the, this, the state is not as good as I would like it, like, having a centralized place where you can just look up all permits issued the way you can with the feds. Um, but I think they're gonna move into that direction. Um, so, but the, the general sense is, and this is the case in some ways that it was for Tortoise, big projects, big developers know they have to comply. They ideally realize that early enough, look at an area of high quality habitat and decide not to go there. But if they don't realize it till they're far enough along, um, they don't want to move, and so they apply for the permit. And so, you know, you know, I may not like the fact that they're getting permits, or that they're, or the scope of the damage they're doing, or the mitigation ratios. But at least the big thing players are largely complying with the process. It's what we've seen. You know, if they're smaller, um, you just pretend it's. It doesn't apply and roll the dice that you won't get prosecuted. Um, and you know, we saw that with tortoise for 30 years, are still seeing it. Um, but I, I, I think that's gonna be get increasingly harder to do with Joshua trees. And you got at this a bit in your presentation, but uh, Steve asks how much time and how much money for a permit? Yeah, so um, under the 2084, say for Yucca Valley, it's pretty quick. You file an application, um, there's, um, it gets heard by the planning commission and, you know, the turnaround time, I would assume is weeks at most. Um, and the, that 2084, different prices based on size of tree and whether you're moving it or killing it, and it ranges from like 175 bucks for a small tree that's being moved to about 4,000 or so for a larger tree that's being killed. Um, and so that incentivizes not killing trees. And if you look at the Planning Commission agenda, it's almost always for um, uh, moving or encroachment. If you're constructing within 10 feet of a tree, you still need a permit, but that one doesn't cost you to mitigate. You just have to do it carefully so as to not um, kill the tree. Um, so it, it's, um, but if you're a standalone, hey, I'm applying for a permit for this one thing, it's um, permit fee, I believe is 7,500 bucks as the lower threshold. The, the, the hardest problem for an individual permit is you need to have CEQA compliance. Um, and if you're part of a big project, you're doing CEQA anyway. So, um, or if you're a local jurisdiction, you can do CEQA broad brush. But if you're the individual homeowner, um, you know, going through the process, you know, it, it's definitely suboptimal. Um, and so you try to avoid 
harming a Joshua tree. The, the solution, and this is one, and I, 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 I don't, you know, the jurisdictions have had a year to plan and get ahead of it so that they, you know, when the listing happens or the 2084 it runs out, there's not going to be a too long a gap between easier permitting. You know, like a community like Yucca Valley could take its existing 2084 system, package it as we want a permit for the city that we then hand out um, under 2081 to all, all residents and the residents then just pay a permit fee and it simplifies and streamlines the process. If we had gotten an NCCP or something similar um, county-wise, it would be incredibly easy for homeowners um, to get such permits, but um, that for that to happen, the county needs to play ball. And um, to date, they're you know they're not. Okay, gonna we have a couple more related questions, but just to, just for very uh, to to vary things a little bit before uh, we close at noon. Wanted to uh, slip in a question that Pat asked, which I absolutely love. Uh, I think possibly because there may not be an answer to it, but there's talk of uh, translocation of Joshua trees to more suitable climbs. Um, and of course, uh, Joshua trees are sort of essentially potted plants unless they have the moth somewhere nearby. Are you aware of uh, any work to figure out what it's gonna take to move moth populations? Um, no, and that, that's an incredibly good question. And um, like, I think of it in that same way, like how the studies of how far can a moth move, like, you know, even in developed areas, what density of Joshua trees do we need to maintain so that moths can survive and those, er those areas can be a habitat corridor, you know, like Yucca Valley, you know, on some level it's, you know, it, it now exists as a town, but that was one of the most magical, beautiful Joshua tree forests on the planet. Probably, it's also one of the most genetically complex ones, so it's essential for conservation. So we need to keep trees alive there and keep connectivity across Yucca Valley, you know, to the north, to Pioneer Town and beyond. Um, and yeah, moth density is important. One, one thing that made me optimistic, and I, it's, I'd say it's worth, uh, everyone's time is there's a podcast called In Defense of Plants, and they have an episode that's about 20 minutes long on yuccas and yucca moths. And one of the person there talks about if, if you plant it, they will come, that they were surprised that certain ornamental plants that they put in differing places didn't expect them to be pollinated and somehow long distance moths found them somewhere. Um, but um, the one study that's closest is um, to answering your question is uh, um, Tickaboo Valley in Nevada is this unique spot where the Eastern and Western species come together and they coexist. Um, and there's a little bit of hybridization, but mostly not. And there's a dry lake bed that's about a kilometer across. Um, and they're doing intense surveys of moths. And that kilometer distance seems to be about enough to largely discourage the moths from traveling. Um, so I, I, I think the folks, really good scientists doing the work there, there's like, they're just cranking out new studies. Um, they'll have the best answers on that in the due time. But it, it may just mean dig, digging up the soil around the tree because the moths larva, um, you know, fall off the, um, you know, fall out of the fruit or the fruits out of the ground, falls to the ground and they tunnel out and go into the ground. So you might be getting off larva if your tree spade is big enough um, to capture the soil around it and you could be transplanting in that way as well. Yeah, a good and uh, Tickaboo Valley is really close to Area 51 too, which sort of lends a, a wonderful sort of uh, frisson to doing research there. You have to be careful what you're looking at with the binoculars. Yeah, um, yeah. I've never been, but it's on my to-do list uh, soon. <laughs> yep. So um, assuming the final decision of the Fish and Game Commission is going to be based on recommendations from Fish and Wildlife, uh, how much will public influence affect 
that decision? How much, how much do our comments mean? I, with this, I think a lot. Um, the, you know, a decade or so ago, the Fish and Game Commission tended to be more conservative. And we would frequently face the situation where the department would recommend protection. The commission would vote three, two or four, one against protection. We would sue them. That would go through the courts over a couple of years and the courts would order them to go back and do it. And we'd eventually get the species protected. The, um, the Fish and Game Commission now is um, pretty good. You know, I think they tend to follow the science. They generally follow the, the commission, the department's recommendations. Um, one, one time I'm aware of, um, and this could be analogous because it's high profile, is um, the wolf. Um, when OR7, the wolf from Oregon, returned to California, you know, seven, eight or so years ago, uh, we petitioned to protect the species under CESA. And there was this whole question of whether, um, you know, an extirpated species, if there's only one of them, is that enough of a population to get state protection? And the department actually recommended against listing. Um, but there was so much public support and pressure, as well as good argument, uh, that the commission voted um, to protect them. And now there's more wolves, and we have a couple packs and all of that. So um, I think it is very impactful. And, 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 and you know, to be frank, like I think the science is clear, and the department um, should recommend protection. But um, one, one thing I've seen, and, and this is not, not uncommon among um, uh, botanists um, that I've, I've talked to, for years, um, if you're familiar with California Native Plant Society, they publish an inventory of rare and endangered plants. And prior to CESA, they've been doing this for decades, prior to CESA, plants could be protected under a different statute, uh, the Native Plant Protection Act, as rare or endangered. The threatened category came later. And so a lot of plant people are in that frame of endangered is easy to understand, you know, you have imminent threats, and rare is easy to understand. There aren't many of them, so randomness could be a thing. But the threatened category of uh, there may be a lot of them, um, but if you project forward, you know, they're going to ultimately become endangered. Um, isn't, isn't part of the standard practice of botanists in California. And so in talking about protecting Joshua trees and talking to various plant people, there is sort of a reflexive, uh, no, we shouldn't protect them. There's so many other endemics that need protection. And I'm like, yes, all the endemics need protection. And we should be petitioning for those as well. But there is this category by law called threatened and Joshua trees fit that definition. So a little bit of me, you know, is always wondering, will, you know, agency botanists who spent their 20, 30, 40 year careers thinking about rare be able to overcome that hurdle that Joshua trees are not rare, yet they do warrant listing. So, yeah. so, so if they if they recommend the wrong way, we're going to need an overwhelming public response to convince the commission to to vote to protect them. That's a really good point. It it also occurs to me that uh, another example of the importance of uh, public comment can be seen in the, an issue that a lot of people here will be quite familiar with, which was the uh, uh, prohibition on bobcat trapping and where in the state of California that was going to be effective. Um, in that the uh, the commission decided to take the 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 buffer area around protected lands and extend it to the state line, uh, which they didn't need to do, except that people got there and supported. But uh, uh, we have just a few minutes left, and uh, wanted to get the last couple of questions in. There were, there have been a couple of questions about. Um, uh, essentially about uh, 
vegetative reproduction of Joshua trees and, uh, you know, instead of reproducing from seed, you know, sending subterranean rhizomes uh, or stolons. I forget the difference between the two. It's been a long time since botany class, but, um, you know, basically stump sprouts and uh, shoots that come up and uh, whether or not those are, are relevant to, uh, to the discussion. And uh, I, I think um, that's probably a, a much longer discussion though uh, maybe you have a short answer uh, in terms of just you know survival during climate uh, climate uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, like um, clonal growth or stem sprouting, you know, clonal growth when they're healthy and they just expand out and stump sprouting post fire or other things are not stump sprouting, but I think in redwood terms from yep. early life, um, it, it, it is, does happen in some areas it happens more than others and it it is an important feature that keeps that helps joshua trees uh respond to to disturbance that would otherwise kill them and so i i think it, there's two categories so like with fire if if you look at an area that burned right after it looks like everything's dead you go back if if there's been rain that year um you'll see a surprising number of sprouts and be like, oh, it didn't actually kill them. Um, but if you track those sprouts over five years, unless there's the right sequence of rain events and enough rain in the summer and things of that sort, uh, the mortality ends up being pretty high. So they can give you a false sense of security. Um, longer term, you know, there's some areas in the West Mojave um, where that clonal growth seems predominant and uh, early botanists described them as their own variety or species um, before genetic methods became available. Um, it was really just, you know, so you can continue reproductively that way for decades, maybe centuries, but long-term evolutionarily, um, you know, you're losing any genetic variation if your only growth is, is asexual reproduction. So. It's, um, it may very well help us get through the rough decades ahead, but it's, it's not a survival strategy that I would put the fate of a species into. So we're, we're pretty close. I wanted to get these last two questions in. They may run the risk of running over time. And um, I hope that that's okay, especially since uh, Steve is one of the people that asked the, one of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, let's start with with Janet's question. Uh, can the CESA process uh, involve a requirement that the county, uh, presumably all counties in in the uh, in the range of the Western Joshua Tree, uh, require uh, pre-construction site inspections? Um, is is that an avenue toward you know yeah, making the protection more effective? You can you can get that as a result. One of the one of the things um, with both state and federal ESA is there's there is not a requirement by the law doesn't require anyone to get a take permit. What the law requires is that no one kill the species without the permit. Um, and so often the, um, the way to, um, you know, harmonize those two is to have rules by the county saying um, survey, make sure they're not there. If they're not there, there's no risk of take, therefore we'll give you the building permit or whatever. Um, and things that are big enough with this uh, CEQA process what they do is, and San Bernardino County is great at, at this sort of shell game of saying, um, we're giving you the permit, but it's your obligation to ensure that you have any take permits if necessary. Um, so, um, the, so it's hard to force an individual property to do it. A willing county, a smart county that actually wanted to protect open space and have rational development and compliance with laws would set those requirements as a condition for building permits like they do so many other things. Um, but 
they don't necessarily have to. That said, there have been successful lawsuits under federal law um, for various species where the county itself, the Board of Supervisors, can be liable for the take that occurs as a result of them issuing a building permit that doesn't have adequate safeguards. And um, um, yeah, so the um, that's an option. Um, and once the species is presumptively protected uh, later this year, um, you know, we're obviously going to review all of our legal options to encourage as much compliance as possible. And we would love to see San Bernardino County follow the Yucca Valley path of like accepting that this is inevitable and they have to deal with it. Let's make the best of it and improve our communities in the process. Great answer. Uh, so Steve's question, which we'll close on, uh, is, uh, is I think Steve had this in mind. It's, it's sort of deceptively wonky on the surface, but I, I expect that you're going to take it in. Having spoken to you about this before, I expect you're going to take it in a somewhat visionary direction. Uh, is there a program for mitigation lands involved in uh, protection of uh, Joshua trees under CESA? Um, yes, there, there's a couple things. One, there's an overall mandate of, hey, the state should identify and acquire lands for protection of, of threatened or endangered species. Um, that's not an entirely funded mandate, but you know, Wildlife Conservation Board and other things directs funding in part by things. You know, part of why Mojave Desert Land Trust has been so successful is they get state funds for desert tortoise for land conservation. So there's that pot of money. The 30 by 30 process also is generating a whole lot of money for various conservation things. But then more specifically uh, to Joshua trees. Um, the developers under the 2084 and any 2081s are um, required to mitigate, and that could be either by acquiring land and protecting it or paying into a fund. There's currently a Joshua Tree Conservation Fund administered by the state, and um, the solar projects, um, the, the ones that were grandfathered in, are paying into that and there's many millions of dollars in that fund. And my understanding is it hasn't been sent, spent yet, but they're trying to figure out what to do. And it could very likely go as grants to land trusts. Of, Here's money, go buy up a bunch of Joshua Tree land. Um, or there's also some talk of using it to expand um, current state protected areas, either state parks or Department of Fish and Wildlife has some of its own ecological reserves and ones that have Joshua trees. If there's adjacent parcels, it's like, hey, let's use the money to add another, you know, 500 acres to it. So there, there will be a lot more money spent on Joshua trees um, in the near future. And if we get listed, get them listed, that's going to just open the gates for a lot more spending. And so I think that's part of why, you know, my Joshua Tree State and National Parks, you know, on one hand, it's, you know, just an ambitious made up thing. On the other hand, they think it's actually viable. Um, you know, we know Hesperia and the Victor Valley are going to infill, you know, those areas have lots of scattered Joshua trees. Yucca Valley is going to continue to grow. Um, we're not going to stop development, but what we want to do is make it smart where um, you know, the ideal scenario is any place with Joshua trees or tortoise that's going to be developed is infill. The, the mitigation fees for that go into funds, which buy up uh, protecting lands that create wildlife corridors and open spaces that improve the communities that this development's happening in, but are also woven into a network connecting our larger protected areas. Um, and you know that's that's the model of what an HCP or an NCCP does. It's like we're going to streamline the permitting process for areas where endangered species are, but if you look at them, they're probably not long-term viable there. You know, a hundred years out, 
and allow those to be developed and have the money from that generated by that to buy the protect these other areas. And that, that model's worked pretty well in the Coachella Valley. Um, and you know, it could have, should have happened out here in the high desert. It's if you've ever been to St. George, the Red Cliffs Preserve, that was largely funded by the HCP for tortoise that allowed the infill um, and sprawl of St. George. So um, yeah. It's it's we're long overdue for something like that in the high desert. Brendan, thank you so much for joining us and for everything you're doing on behalf of this species that we all love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for having me here. My pleasure. And yeah, thank you all for all that your great work as well. Thank you so much, Brendan and, and Chris, for being here today. This is really a, a terrific presentation. And in closing, I'd like to uh, I'd like to remind everyone what Ruth Riemann says to me is that we make a difference. MBCA makes a difference and your comments make a difference. So uh, on these many issues that are affecting us here, speak up, let your voice be heard and uh, it will make a difference. So uh, thanks so much for everyone being here and uh, we look forward to, please attend the, our monthly board meetings are open to the public. Uh, you can get a link by emailing or, or checking our website, mbconservation.org, and tune in. We'd love to see you at our meetings and uh, share your insights and your, uh, your viewpoints on, on these many issues. So thanks so much. <laughs>